Hello and welcome to the Infinite 11's Anatomy of Horror, a series dedicated to the art of horror filmmaking, and really filmmaking in general. Film and TV are possibly the most widely appreciated and consumed art forms today. And though there is a very technical and non-artistic aspect to film, it is the artistry that inspires us and keeps us coming back for more. The writing, the photography, the sound design, set designs are all departments within production filled with artists. And these departments all serve the vision of the director. And that's what we focus on. Great directors who had complete artistic control and by analyzing their choices, because everything you see and hear on film is a choice, you begin to understand that this is a language. And if you are at all interested in making and directing films, then studying the greats is the best thing you can do. With that being said, tonight, we are going to discuss a titan among horror films and a fantastic example of low budget ingenuity in part one of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's written by Toby Hooper and Kim Hankel, directed by Toby Hooper, and that's coming up next. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre revolves around a young woman named Sally, her disabled brother, and three friends who road trip through a desolate Texas town in order to find out if their grandfather's grave had been desecrated. Expecting a simple, brief trip, the group find themselves victim to a family of psychopaths, one of them wearing a mask made of human skin and wielding a chainsaw. I'll be honest, I didn't love this film the first time I saw it. I felt it was seriously dated, crudely made, and it didn't live up to the immense shadow that it cast over the genre, and that's a notion that's shared by others. But I was wrong. Texas Chainsaw is far more sophisticated and nuanced than it lets on. And we'll start with the visionary himself, Toby Hooper. Now, Toby Hooper wasn't some small-time wannabe with big dreams and a lot of luck. He was a professor of film and worked as a cameraman on documentary films. He knew what he was doing. Inspired by what George Romero did with Night of the Living Dead, Hooper was convinced he could use his knowledge of film and create an effective, low-budget masterpiece, and that's exactly what he did. So let's start with the script. But before we dive in, real quick, if you like these videos or you get something out of them, then please like this video and subscribe to our channel. We have a lot of great content coming up for you in the future that I think you're gonna like. So Hooper and co-writer Kim Hankel, both Texas natives, wanted to write a film that was set in and about Texas. And this makes sense, because with an extremely low budget, you want to film local. Scouting locations is easier to do at home. You live there, you have connections. So the film is about a group of early 20-somethings, and every one of them represents the type of people that were valued during that era. You've got the young jock type and his sweet, pretty, new age girlfriend. You have the easygoing intellectual type. You have the liberal, kind, pretty woman, as well as the disabled brother. This was the future and the now. At the polar end is the Sawyer family. They are everything that the world wants to and has forgotten. A family pushed to the fringes of society by technology and feasting on what is dead. Themes include disenfranchised people, the dark side of patriarchy, xenophobia, classism, and of course, cannibalism. Now the budget. It's rumored that the actual cost after post-production was somewhere in the realm of $90,000, probably more. And adjusting for inflation is around $600,000 today. That's not a lot of money. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's not. Not when you're shooting on film. Film is and was expensive, finite, and time consuming. You have fewer takes to get the shots that you need, and if you run out of film, you have no movie. And this leads us to an important aspect of the film. I mentioned before how Toby Hooper worked as a camera operator on documentary films, and that is an important style used early in the first act. But we'll get to that in a second. A low budget means less time to shoot. So Hooper and company needed to be able to prepare to shoot as fast as possible before moving on to the next shot and so on. To do that, they needed as little equipment as possible and that equipment had to be lightweight. They shot on an Eclair NPR, a 16 millimeter film camera popular with documentary filmmakers because of its ability to quickly load and unload film. The camera itself was about 20 pounds loaded with a roll of film. Lighter than most cinema cameras, but too heavy to pull off some of the trickier shots they had planned. For those shots, they used a Bolex H16, which was a consumer level camera with different lens options. Loaded with film, it was around eight or nine pounds. And we'll get to all of those shots in a bit. The film stock was 16 millimeter low contrast film. Low contrast means no heavy shadows. And that's important when your main key light is the sun. The sun is the best friend to all low budget filmmakers, but can also be a curse because it's usually a really harsh light and during most of the day will need both diffusion to cut down on the intensity 
as well as a neutral density filter, which is kind of like sunglasses for your lens. Since Hooper shot most of the film in the daylight hours, he needed a film stock that could really cut down on those deep shadows. Now, the choice of shooting daylight, I believe, is twofold. One, it enhances that documentary feel to it, and two, it's way cheaper. Having the sun as your key light is worth the headache of constantly setting up and moving diffusion because the sun is constantly shifting. It's a light you don't have to buy or rent, and you don't have to lug it around everywhere. Now on to that documentary film look. Sometime in the late 1950s and early 60s, direct cinema was born. Direct cinema is a type of documentary film whose main objective was to be the antithesis of mainstream documentary, and that very often leaned towards propaganda or was just outright propaganda. Direct cinema was usually absent of any contact with the subjects, and there was no narration and no interviews. The result was a fly-on-the-wall type of perspective, objectively watching the subtle details of the film's subjects. This style became a very popular aspect of documentary film thereafter, namely with network documentary programs you would see on CBS in the late 60s, like Hunger in America or 60 Minutes. Mind you, this is 1974. There were like only three or four channels on TV, and every station had their own news programs, and people trusted them. The news equaled the truth. It was a fact. And the news looked a lot like this did. So when people saw this in 1974, they felt like they were watching something real. In fact, here's a snippet of how the 1968 film Hunger in America starts. Hunger is hard to recognize in America. We know it in other places. Now, watch how the Texas Chainsaw Massacre starts. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. In part two, I'm going to dive into the opening sequence. But if you went to go see this movie at that time and some guy who sounds just like a newscaster is saying this. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. And then they show you this. led officers of the Muerto County Sheriff's Department to a cemetery just. You just might crap your pants. And if that's hard to believe, and maybe you've even heard this story, but one of the very first moving pictures to ever be shown called Arrival of a Train, the Lumiere brothers, creators of the picture, showed it to a packed exhibition house. Upon seeing the train coming toward them on screen, the audience immediately got up and ran to the back of the theater, fearing that they were about to be squashed by the oncoming train. They'd never seen anything like that before and had nothing to compare it to. The van scenes of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre looked real, like something you might see on the nightly news. After the opening sequence, almost every scene is shot on a wide-angle lens where everything is in focus, a lot like how a documentary film would be shot. Also, there's barely any soundtrack, only the radio, and most of the time the radio is playing the news, enhancing the realism. So this all makes sense, right? Toby Hooper had worked on documentaries before as a cameraman, but he was also a film professor. When Sally and friends make it to her father's dilapidated home, things change. And here is that special nuance, and it is so subtle that it took me several viewings to catch. Look at this shot right here. This is when Texas Chainsaw goes from being a documentary-style film into a horror film. It's a low-angle dolly shot, shot beyond the shrubbery. Stylistically, this is classic horror. And let's go back to the two shots setting this one up and take a listen. The soundtrack kicks in, whereas it was practically non-existent before. And right from the get-go, everything about the photography in these scenes are far more interesting and cinematic, from the lighting, the shot composition, and the lens choices. This was not some happy accident. This was planned and executed at a historic level. You set the stage by convincing your audience that what they are about to see is real. And once you establish that, you bring them the horror. When you shoot low budget, you have to rely on your strengths as a filmmaker to make up for the fact that you have so much going against you. I'm sure you've heard the saying, time is money. Well, this certainly applies to film. The longer it takes to film, the more shots added, the more characters, the more locations needed, the more expensive it's going to be. Like I said before, Hooper had to do more with less. So he had himself a smallish cast consisting entirely of local actors, which means he didn't have to pay for the traveling expenses. It didn't have to pay for a hotel. There were also very few locations. You have the open Texas highways. You have the cemetery in the beginning, the cattle farm Sally and friends drive by. Then there was a gas station, interior and exterior, both day and night. You had Sally's father's dilapidated home, interior, exterior. You have the forest or that large piece of vacant land where the dry pond is and where Leatherface chases Sally at night. And then you have the Sawyer house, both inside and out. 
That's seven locations at all, and the bulk of the film's runtime is spent only at four of those locations. That means cast and crew are filming more in less time. And that's the brilliance of how Toby Hooper shoots this film. He knows how he was going to shoot the first quarter of the film, that simple matter-of-fact style. So this allows him to use the same shots over and over again within a scene and not make it seem too repetitive, like the hitchhiker scene, which I'll completely break down in part two. But notice how we keep cutting back to the same shots over and over. For the hitchhiker, he's shot in a medium to wide and then a close up to medium, but it's the exact same setup, meaning they got two separate shots while only having to set up additional lights and reflectors once with minimal tinkering. But it's when the style changes is when we see true low budget ingenuity. I mentioned before that they used a Bolex H16, a consumer camera, on occasion to get shots that were too difficult for the heavier Eclair NPR to achieve on their budget like the ultimate shot in the opening sequence right here. This is such a fantastic shot, and it's a dolly crane shot, meaning the camera was set upon a crane that is on a dolly or tracks. And judging from this photo right here on the set of TCM, it looks as though they built the crane and tracks by hand out of wood. Or when they wanted to get a smooth handheld shot like these two shots right here, and at this point in time, there was no such thing as a steady cam, so for them to get this shot at all is very impressive. And of course, this under the swing tracking shot or the red shorts shot that absolutely wowed other filmmakers. In fact, this shot was so great that upon meeting Hooper for the very first time, the very first words out of a young Steven Spielberg were, how did you get the under the swing shot? The difference between this shot and the others was that this one shot was actually on their main camera at the Eclair NPR. Daniel Pearl, the cinematographer, laid low on a platform dolly with wheels and held the front of the camera up to get the shot. As you can see, there were some very well planned out and aesthetically pleasing shots used in the film. Shots that usually take more time to set up and more time to shoot. So to offset the time lost, Hooper and company cut down on the time spent on other scenes and shots. He did this two ways. The first is he would pick a scene that could be done in one take or as few as possible. And a fantastic example are two scenes in the second act right here. The first scene is where Sally and Franklin await the return of their friends. It's golden hour, meaning it's late in the day and the sun is at its lowest point in the sky, meaning the light is even, soft, and warm. Chances are, this was the only light they needed, the sun, making the setup very simple. But of course, you only have a certain amount of time to get the shot before you lose the light altogether. But even though this entire scene is done in one take, it feels seamless and fits the bare bones nature of so much of the film. Even better, it's most likely done in the same setup in the same location moments earlier. This is a wide dolly shot on a wide lens. Then go back to our original shot, but this one is on a longer lens. A few scenes later, and we are right back in the same location with the same two characters, the same van, and we're even facing in the exact same direction. Now, I don't know this for sure, but it's very likely that they shot the previous scene, got it before the sun went down, and then immediately set up for this shot right here. This scene, being far more complex than the previous, but as you see, is only three shots, and it takes up what could be three pages of script, if not a little more. The lighting schematic is simple, a key light with possibly a fill light motivated by the moonlight with two practical lights in the headlights as well as Franklin's flashlight. This is the master shot, what we are looking at right now. It's nearly two minutes long without cuts. It starts static and then shows itself to be a dolly shot moving screen right. Then we cut to the second shot here and then a shot similar to where the master shot ends up except we are closer in on the action. One location, five shots in all, about six pages of script completed. Not bad for a day's work. Another way Hooper and his team were able to make time for complex shots on a tight schedule and budget is recycling shots and setups between scenes. The previous shots we looked at are all pretty good examples of this as well, but a better example is when we finally get to the Sawyer house. In this scene, we have Kirk looking into the house and we see the hallway right here that leads to the butchering room. Now, a few moments later, we have this. I know, it's not the same shot because it's not the same angle, but the lighting setup is the same. Not too long after this, we have Pam snooping around, and this is her point of view. Again, it's a different shot, but it's the same setup. And then two more times for Pam, same setup. Is it possible that all of these shots were not shot in succession? Sure, but on a low budget, why not shoot them all together? Another example, we have Pam looking through the screen door into the house. And then, about 10 minutes later, we have Jerry doing the same thing and the same shot. Now the lighting is different here, and it's clearly later in the day for Jerry, so it's possible the cast and crew wrapped for lunch, and then when they came back, the sun was lower and they were able to get the difference in lighting. Of course, all being said, 
According to Daniel Pearl, the DP, Toby Hooper refused to do a shot list, or at least one he intended to use because he wanted to shoot it in the moment. But it's just crazy for me to think that they did all these setups over and over again. It's just a waste of time. So I do believe my assumptions on how they shot the film are pretty close to the truth. So that's gonna wrap up part one of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, with part two coming up next week, where I'll break down and analyze some of the film's most iconic scenes. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre stars Marilyn Burns, Paul A. Partain, Terry McMinn, Alan Danziger, William Vale, and Gunnar Hansen. Until next time.